The low-lying region of East Anglia boasts historic towns and villages, fens and broads, miles of magnificent coastline, and a great deal more. While the train from Cambridge to Sheringham and beyond provides a delightful introduction to this quiet corner of rural England. We start in the city of Cambridge. Settled since Roman times, the present layout converges on the ancient Norman church of the Holy Sepulchre and on the marketplace, which is dominated by the church of Great St. Mary. But the real fame of Cambridge rests on its university and colleges. The first was founded in 1280, and there are 15 others which date from medieval and Tudor times. One of the most attractive is King's College, built by Henry VI in the 15th century. Here, Gothic architecture nears perfection in a fabulous cathedral-like chapel. Behind the colleges is the River Cam, in an area known as the Backs. These lawns, willows and bridges have been described as the most perfect man-made view in England. In the summer, punts can be hired for a leisurely trip along the Backs. <laughs> Leaving Cambridge on the St Edmunds line, we head east towards Ipswich. The line is worked by Class 150 and Class 153 sprinters and super sprinters, second generation diesel multiple units introduced in the mid 80s. Newmarket is a pleasant town, famed as the home of the Jockey Club and Britain's main centre for horse racing. English monarchs have been coming to the races here since the 1600s. During one visit by Charles II, most of the town was destroyed by fire and had to be rebuilt. For anyone interested in the turf, the National Horse Racing Museum is a must. Visitors are also welcome at the National Stud, where the highlight is a tour of the stallion unit. The statue is of Mill Reef, but the current residence includes Suave Dancer, an Arc de Triomphe and French Derby winner. Older stallion, but he's got a lovely pedigree line there again. He's a full brother to Chris and Diocese. Very nice, Why 
wide open fields lead on to Bury St. Edmunds, a Saxon settlement almost one and a half thousand years old. The station is far more recent and has just been restored. On the platform, a painter records the old maltings, now redundant and awaiting demolition. In the town itself, the ancient gatehouse leads to the abbey ruins. These peaceful gardens conceal a turbulent past. The town takes its name from the murdered King Edmund, was buried here, and at the great altar of the Abbey Church, King John's barons conspired to bring about the Magna Carta. The town itself is mostly George, but based on the medieval formula of a square for God and a square for man. Here we find the oldest domestic building in East Anglia, the 12th century Moyes Hall. Just a few miles away is the West Stow Anglo-Saxon village. Archaeological excavations have led to the reconstruction of a settlement which dates from about 600 AD. Listen, the fame of Danish kings in days gone by, the daring feats worked by those heroes are well known to us. Perhaps Thar was Rothgar a herrespeed gufen, uigas weathmund, that him his winamagas ye yorn a hurdon, oth that se ye yorn fatally wounded, Grendel was obliged to make for the marshes, head for his joyless lair. He was well aware that his life's days were done, come to an end. After that, deadly. Beyond Bury St. Edmunds, the line is elevated. The provincial diesels are equipped with Cummins engines, and here they approach their maximum speed of 75 miles per hour. The quiet Suffolk village of Elmswell has an impressive church, a reminder of the region's importance in earlier times. The calm is disturbed by the fast intercity trains, which also use the line. Stowe Market sports another splendid station, this time in the Jacobean style. In the town, the church has both a tower and a spire, and there is an excellent museum of East Anglian life.
Ipswich is at the end of the St. Edmunds line, but rail traffic continues to the port at Felixstowe. Ipswich town centre is based on an ancient butter market. You have to look up to see the best of the buildings. It's the upper stories which have escaped modernization. Charles Dickens stayed here at the Great White Horse Hotel and found a setting for Mr. Pickwick. Ipswich was the birthplace of Cardinal Wolsey and still has no less than 12 medieval churches. The Church of St. Mary Le Tower once sheltered within the town's defensive ramparts. It still provides sanctuary from the outside world. Recently, Ipswich has been revitalized. Impressive modern flats and offices now front the old docks with a few traditional Thames barges to provide a touch of authenticity. Further down river, the Orwell Yacht Club has found shelter beneath the new road bridge. The East Suffolk Line was opened in 1859 and runs from Ipswich to Lowestoft. After crossing Muttlesham Heath, the train runs into Woodbridge, a small town at the head of the Devon estuary. The most eye-catching building is the weatherboarded Tide Mill, built in the 18th century. But boat builders and sailmakers have been at work here for at least six centuries. The remote station of Wickham Market allows an excursion down the tidal river Ald. The salt marshes are home to many species of wild birds and sailing barge trips are available from the riverside centre at Snape Mortings. These granaries and malt houses once shipped malted barley to London and Norwich. Now they are home to a bewildering assortment of shops and galleries, while the Maltings Concert Hall and the Aldborough Festival have won an international reputation for music. There's also a school of music named after the composer Benjamin Britten, who composed his opera Peter Grimes here. Looking in from the marshes, there are sculptures by Henry Moore.
further down the river is the pretty fishing village of Aldersborough. The Moot Hall dates from 1650 and is an elegant blend of brick, stone and timber. There are other beautiful buildings along the whole length of the seafront. Many of the locals still make a living from the sea and the beach is given over to their boats, nets and huts. Sexmundum, there was once a branch line to the nearby Leaston. The station houses the only remaining signal box on the line, now a computerised control centre with automated level crossings and radio communication to the drivers. With passengers declining, the line was reduced from double to single track, and the single unit Leyland Bus Super Sprinter is rarely full, despite running only one train every two hours. Leeston's abbey ruins date from the 14th century. Like so many others, this abbey was disbanded by Henry VIII. In the village itself, the Long Shop Museum occupies the first flow line production assembly hall in the world. Here, between 1840 and 1940, Richard Garrett built thousands of portable steam traction engines. The company also specialized in agricultural machinery and the exhibits illustrate the diversity of Garrett products through the years. The long shop itself was completed in 1853 and was known locally as the Cathedral. Some of the surviving Garrett engines are displayed here. Gradually, the museum's collection is being restored and visitors can keep an eye on their progress. It's a um, Garrett 4CD tractor. It's one of the smaller uh, traction engines Garrett's produced. Really, every part of the engine has been uh, cleaned right down and repainted. A single track branch line still leads to the nuclear power station at Sizewell. This is Britain's only pressurized water reactor and an exhibition center provides for the curious visitor.
From the next station, Darsham, it is possible to explore the Suffolk Heritage Coast. The village of Dunwich was once a large town and seaport, but since medieval times it has been completely lost to the sea through coastal erosion. At Dunwich Heath, the sandy cliffs, beach and heathland are now owned by the National Trust. We've got heathland sea and we've got marshland and bits of woodland all of which comprise of quite a lot of um, designations for the area. We're a heritage coast, an area of outstanding natural beauty and a site of special scientific interest. We've also got a lot of rare birds. We've got bitterns booming away in the background. We've got uh, other sets nearby on the Minsmere Reserve next door to us. We've got stone jats. We've got one Dartford warbler, which is quite a rarity for Suffolk. Um, we've uh, got a lot of reptiles here as well, which are well worth coming to see. Approaching Lowestoft, the line crosses Oulton Broad. Nearby, the East Anglia Transport Museum has one of the country's largest collections of street transport. Trolleybuses and trams are regularly in action with pre-war shops and buildings to provide an authentic setting. Trams and trolleybuses are from towns and corporations all over Britain, but tram car number 474 is from Amsterdam. Number 159 was built in 1927 and served as an illuminated tram in Blackburn. There's also a two-foot gauge light railway, which will carry visitors up and down the site. The locomotive is a 1936 Rustum, 
which first saw service in a cement works. At the end of the line is Lowestoft, one of Suffolk's major resorts. The park at Sparrow's Nest provides quiet relaxation. Bowling Green Cottage houses a small maritime museum and cobbled steps and paths lead to the site of the original beach village. In the town centre, there is more activity. Lowestoft still supports a large fishing fleet and the fish dock has recently been refurbished. Lowestoft, Norwich and Great Yarmouth are connected by the Huerry Line. Near to Oulton Broad North is Boatworld. This is an international training college for boat builders where visitors are welcome to look around and watch the boats take shape. Summer Leighton is a sleepy village on the edge of the marshes, with a village green surrounded by thatched cottages. Summer Leighton Hall is a magnificent Victorian mansion and the home of Lord and Lady Summer Layton. I think the special thing is that it was in the, this building here is as a result of the Industrial Revolution, 1847. My uh, Sir Morton Peto, who was a great public contractor in those days, he bought it as a Jacobean house. Then he uh, made it bigger and grander and more Victorian. And um, so it, it's always known as an Italianate Victorian building. Great-grandfather came here in 1863. He bought it from Sir Morton Peter. He bought the whole estate from Sir Morton Peter. And he was a carpet manufacturer in Halifax in Yorkshire. And um, he bought this to retire to, but in fact he never did really retire here, but he was also living in Halifax. The house is surrounded by statues. The estate has more than 12 acres of gardens, and they were noted as far back as the 17th century.
One of the most popular features of the garden is the maze, one of the finest in Britain. It was designed by William Nesfield and planted in 1846. In the centre of the maze, there's a small pagoda on top of a grassy mound. For those who wish to ride, there's also a miniature steam railway which operates on a quarter mile of seven and a quarter inch gauge track. We move on to Reedham, from where a line runs north through Burney Arms to Great Yarmouth. Entering Norfolk, a high swing bridge crosses the River Yare. This river is always busy with holiday traffic. At Reedham, a chain-hauled car ferry provides the only road crossing between Norwich and Great Yarmouth. Set in the middle of the Reedham Marshes is Burney Arms Station. It is one of Britain's most isolated, with access only by boat. Burney Arms Windmill is one of Norfolk's most famous and was built to drain the marshes which lie below the sea level. A nature reserve covers the marshes, which is home to many wild birds and animals. Over the river lie the ruins of Burg Castle, which dates from the third century. This was the Roman fort of Garionunum built to defend what was once a great estuary from the Saxon marauders. Great Yarmouth is one of the leading resorts of the East Coast, boasting six miles of sandy beaches, centered upon the Britannia Pier and the Golden Mile. As well as the traditional seaside attractions, there is a fine monument to Lord Nelson, a busy port and the remains of medieval walls and churches. In the evening, the seafront comes alive with horse-drawn carriages, amusements, and the pleasure beach.
passing west through Akel, the Huere Line heads for Norwich. Norwich Thorpe Station is a splendid railway terminus, the great central dome and French Renaissance facade. From here, intercity and cross-country services connect with London and the rest of the country. The capital of East Anglia has been a place of importance for over a thousand years. The royal castle was built shortly after 1066, and Norwich was once one of the largest towns in England. The cathedral has England's second highest spire. It was started in 1096 using white stone from Caen in Normandy. The city's development was beset with crises. In 1272, rioting citizens fought the monks. The Black Death claimed a third of the population, and in 1381, Norwich was captured by rebels during the Peasants' Revolt. <laughs> the tiny streets and alleyways are crammed with unusual shops and museums, including the source of the original English mustard. This is a lively city, and in summer, there are buskers on every corner. We head north now, on the Broads Line. Roxham is at the heart of the Norfolk Broads National Park, a low-lying area of shallow lakes created by Saxon peat digging. The best of the broads can only be seen from the water, and there are hundreds of pleasure craft available for hire. There are also plenty of excursions, including a trip on the vintage broadsman.
Roxham Broad is a favourite with sailing boats, and there's always plenty of wildlife to see. Roxham is also the terminus of the Bure Valley Railway. This 15-inch narrow-gauge line runs for nine miles along the abandoned track bed of the historic East Norfolk Railway. Number six is a half-scale replica of the 262 ZB class tender locomotives built for use on the narrow-gauge railways of India. Built in 1994, along with sister locomotive number seven, they are among the most powerful narrow-gauge steam engines ever built. After taking on coal and water, number six runs around a train before running up the line to Elsham. Not far from Aylsham is Blickling Hall, a magnificent 17th century country house with gardens and parkland, all owned and protected by the National Trust. Beyond the hall, there is an ornamental lake and the great wood. Walks through this ancient woodland lead through the bluebells to the pyramid, an imposing mausoleum built for the Earl of Buckingham in 1795.
narrow gauge diesel number three pulls into Aylsham as the ZD class locomotive prepares to return to Roxham. The line passes RAF Coltishall, from where tornado jets make regular sorties. Back on British Rail, the next stop is at North Walsham. The swapping of tokens gives possession of the next section of the line. North Walsham has an unusual covered market dating from 1550. There's also a motorcycle museum and one of Norfolk's largest parish churches. The medieval woolen industry paid for East Anglia's abundant churches. Unfortunately, the tower on this one collapsed in 1724. Cromer Station, built by the Eastern and Midlands Railway in 1887, is a terminus and the train must reverse before continuing. Guarded by tall cliffs, this is a popular family resort. The pier was opened in 1901 by Lord Claude Hamilton, chairman of the Great Eastern Railway. With canoes out to sea, the town's crabbing boats can be found on the beach. This last section of line through West Runton is the only surviving piece of the old Midland and Great Northern Railway. Not far from the station is the Norfolk Shire Horse Centre. As well as collecting different breeds of draft horses, British ponies and other animals, the centre has an extensive collection of machines, carts, wagons and caravans. There are also daily demonstrations and special events. Today, there's a demonstration of horse plowing, seeding, and timber loading. Who back? Who back? Good boy, Willie. Who back? And the year, we're into work, and now we'll sow the seed. Now, got to keep nice and straight. Well, 
Good, good boy. I want to get that that way, but you got it. Sheringham and the end of the line. But our journey is not quite finished yet. This old fishing village now attracts holidaymakers. Above the town, there are paths along the steep glacial cliffs of Beeston Hump. Sheringham Park was developed by Humphrey Repton, possibly England's greatest landscape gardener. On preparing his scheme for the estate in 1812, Repton reported that uh, Sheringham possesses more natural beauty and local advantages than any place I've ever seen. The park is famous for its rhododendrons and the open woodland attracts plenty of wildlife. In 1985, the estate was purchased by the National Trust and is now open to visitors. But Sheringham has another railway station from where the North Norfolk Railway runs full-size steam trains along a preserved line to Holt. The railway has an impressive collection of steam and diesel locomotives, but their prized possession is number 8572, a London and Northeastern D12. Built in 1928, this is the world's only surviving example of an inside cylindered 460. These powerful machines gave sterling service on the old Great Eastern network until superseded in the 1950s. Eight five seven two was saved for preservation and finally restored over thirty years later in nineteen ninety four. The line to hold runs through beautiful scenery along the coast and through woodland and heathland. Sheringham. The B-12 prepares for a Pullman wine and dine 
evening special.